presentation this morning is being provided by our brother Daniel, and his title is Diligence. He, he d doesn't have any uh, requested reading to begin with because he assures me there is it's chock full of it. So, so brother Daniel. Thank you, Brother David. This morning we're going to be talking about diligence. Um, to start off these thoughts, I want to bring everybody back to a time about 15 years ago when Caleb and I moved to the Finger Lakes area for one summer. Um, ended up being one summer for me, but about five or six years for Caleb. So the first job we had was shoveling gravel around for hours and hours um, for a foundation before the concrete was poured. That, that day wasn't too hard. The next job that we were tasked with was digging footers for a large deck. Um, essentially, these are digging holes where the posts um, for the deck will go, um, sitting on and inside of concrete. The depth required for these is determined by the frost level or the frost line in the region. Fortunately, we were in New York, which required a minimum depth of about four feet. Um, if we're in Virginia, it would have been a little too easy. Um, so we were digging through hard clay-like soil um, which was very much riddled with rocks, and um, there were so many rocks that we were happy when they were only a few inches thick. Believe it or not, the tool used for the majority of the work is not a shovel, it's not a post hole digger. When you reach a certain depth, um, especially in upstate New York, um, you lose the ability to effectively use either one of those tools um, due to the width of the holes. So if I were to hop into one of those holes, it would probably come up to about here. Um, so that's why we use this um, digging bar. Um, so I'm probably gonna slip up a few times in this exhortation. Caleb and I called them digging bars, which apparently nobody else calls them. Um, I looked that up and nobody else uses that, so I don't know if that was a Joel thing or us, but either way. So they're technically called digging bars. Um, they're also known as hot bars, slate bars, shale bars, spud bars, pinch bars, or San Angelo bars. Um, the tool is about five to six feet in length and it's made out of solid steel. It looks like a javelin. Um, but because it's made out of solid steel, it weighs between 15 and 25 pounds. This tool is used to shave down the sides of the hole that you are digging and is used to cut deep into the bottom of the hole so that the earth can be removed easily. And this tool requires continuous throwing and wedging of the tool for hours and hours. Um, we had blisters like crazy, but it was still a good time up there. So why am I talking about a digging bar or digging bar? Um, if diligence were a tool, what would it be? In my mind, I would think of it as a digging bar. You just have to keep working at it with this tool. Other tools, um, other tools work, but not close to the level of progress that the digging bar will yield. Digging bars are amazing tools that can also be used, used to break up concrete, frozen ground, tree roots, or cut through other obstacles. They cut right through them with quite a bit of weight and momentum behind each throw. Regardless, with the digging bar, it requires unrelenting throwing and wedging to make progress when working. This tool requires stamina, persistence, and patience. Um, today, when talking about diligence, I would like us to focus on a few things. What is diligence to God? We will look at some passages with commandments from God to the people. Um, if we are to examine ourselves, where do we focus our diligence? I would also like us to consider what is diligence to us as individuals or as a community of believers. Starting with some of the more familiar passages about work. In Ecclesiastes we read, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And then from Colossians chapter 3 verses 23 and 24, whatsoever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is Christ the Lord that you are serving. It is clear from the scriptures that we are instructed to always work with integrity and diligence, whatever we find ourselves doing in life. But how do we apply this diligence to our spiritual lives? Um, looking at diligence in the scriptures, diligence is most commonly used in the Old Testament and the majority of uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. If we look directly at the commandments from God, we can see in Deuteronomy 6, starting at verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Might, excuse me. Um, so 
the singularity of God is the first forefront of the commandments there to man. Um, secondly, loving our God is also at the forefront of his commandments to us. We are to be diligent in loving God. And what a con concept this would have been for the Israelites at this time. These people were slaves, used and abused at the bottom of society, where their leader, leader Pharaoh, was proclaimed to be a god on earth. Then Yahweh, the one true God, saves them and commands their love to him. He refers to them as his treasured possession, and he speaks of them, of, speaks of setting his love on them. What a departure that would have been for them, for a departure from what they had previously endured. I'm sure it was still fresh in their mind when they're hearing these words from, from Moses, from God. John as well expands on this, um, if you want to keep your fingers in Deuteronomy 6, if anybody's there, but um, look into 1 John chapter 4, verse 21. In this commandment we have from him, who, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the Father, loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, and when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It is imperative that we also love our brethren. The extension of our love to God. God also emphasizes the importance of keeping God's commandments. Let us turn back to Dodd, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We are to hold the words of God so close to us. The imagery used indicates the utmost importance on our hearts, on our hands, and between our eyes. Um, at the forefront of what we see and what we do. We are to diligently teach his commandments to our, teacher, to our children and to speak of them with persistence. Do we find ways to always speak of God, of his plan, of his hope, and his purpose? Continuing to verse 10 of the same chapter in Deuteronomy. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, take care lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is your Lord God you shall fear. Him shall you serve, in his name you shall swear." You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in the midst a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroys you from off the face of the earth. Here God emphasizes the perspective of the blessings around us. We must be diligent in remembering God and keeping him, and keeping an attitude of thankfulness. How much around us can we truly take credit for? How much of our food did we actually grow? Did we pave the roads we drive on to get here? Do we build our homes or this chapel that we worship in? How quickly can we switch to think that we are being self-sufficient? Furthermore, we must strive to keep God as the one that we worship and follow. No one else, no man, not money, not vanity. Friends in our ecclesia can be a blessing for our checks and balances here. We are comfortable. Are we comfortable speaking with our friends of our shortcomings or, or focuses? Going back to when Caleb and I were digging footers, when we were digging these footers of the deck, we knew, we, um, we knew that we needed about 16 or 18 of these, and it took about a week um, to get all of these dug. It was a long time. However, when the inspector came, we found out that there was a mistake in some, where some of the holes were supposed to be dug or how many there had to be. So we essentially had to fill in some of the holes that we had painstakingly dug and began digging a handful of new ones, which again, had to be 48 inches deep. We took the correction in stride and got going again. Paul as well commands us to examine ourselves whenever we take the bread and wine, remembering Jesus. Are we aware of the corrections that we need to make? Do we take those in stride? Furthermore, where do we focus our diligence? When I do a little bit of introspection, I think about where I focus my diligence. I am far too often preoccupied with work. Um, I think we are in the age of information, and I appreciate that, but it's kind of become a stumbling block for me. I try to respond to emails within a few hours every day, whether I'm on or on off the clock. I try to remotely fix issues that come up as soon as possible. 
even if others are able to do it. I'm impatient when it comes to getting responses from colleagues or clients. Um, that being said, my employment has helped me grow a lot, but admittedly it takes up much more of my focus than it should. James exhorts us in um, chapter 5, to be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of our Lord is at hand. I see here a lesson to myself that I need to focus more on being patient. Where are our hearts and minds focused? What is the most important thing to us? Are we focused on the eternal things or the things immediately in front of us? Continuing in James. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. An example of suffering and patience, brothers. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those who blessed, who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Part of our diligence must be to exercise patience with steadfastness. Patience with our families, our brothers and sisters, those who we preach to, and sometimes even ourselves. What do the prophets exercise in the name of God to the Israelites? So much patience and so much perseverance. Perseverance. God also, as we know, works tire- tirelessly with us when we are foolish or when we resist his will or when we are slow to learn. Jonah, who when the Lord called on him, tried to flee from the presence of the Lord. Eventually, God gets Jonah to Nineveh, where he called him to go. And even after Nineveh was eventually saved, Jonah was unhappy, and God continued to work with Jonah at that time as well. Saul, who became Paul, was a man who at one point breathed threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Yet he is later referred to as a chosen instrument to carry the name of Christ. I'm sure all of us, and well, all of us as well have specific examples of God working in our lives, or in the lives of those that we love. Um, Working with us to bring us closer to him. When we feel that we are far from God, God, is he able to pull us back to him? Do we look for those signs around us? Going back to the digging bar again. um, When you use a heavy tool like a digging bar, um, especially for long projects, it is important to let the power and the weight of the tool do the lion's share of the work. If I was to use my back and force the bar down to the ground with every swing or throw, I couldn't go for hours and hours. I couldn't do it for days on end. Although now that I'm over 35, I don't think any of that's on the table anyways. But whether you're using a hammer or a bar, use the weight of the tool that you're using um, to do the impact, to make that impact. Um, Part of that is just working smartly, but part of it is allowing the tool to be used as, as it's designed. And I believe in some ways this is what our diligence can be. Letting the word of God have the real impact, not our force. Letting the love that we have from God to work the change needed. From Colossians we read, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I like to focus a lot on semantics, and I feel like the use of the word let is a much more passive word than you know, diligence or steadfast or work. It's just kind of allowing that to come inside ourselves. Let's look a little bit more at that passage. Let's go to first to Colossians 3, verse 12. Um, Here we see more guidance in how to follow our God. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one is a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also forgive. These are the characteristics that we must also be diligent with. Forgiving, kind, humble, meek, and patient. Continuing, and above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, for the Father through him. Getting close to the conclusion here. As we read in Galatians 6 through 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are in the household of faith. And lastly, I'd like to close back with a passage from Deuteronomy again. 
um, from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. For what great nation, nation is there that a God has so that has a God so near to it as the Lord God is to us whenever we call upon him, and by extension us when we read this as well? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all the law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Thank you. <laughs> 